30 days in, in Germany and also in Harvard Medical School. And then he went back to Germany for residency and fellowship in France. Uh, he will speak today about dural AB fistulas with PL supply, which is a topic that we, the fellows, specifically didn't really recognize as, a, as an entity and as a real danger. Uh, there, are no, there are no many things to say about Professor Krings. He's well known. His books are all over the place. We really use them as, a, as tutorials. And before the cases, we try to take a look at the exquisite anatomy that he presents. So, Professor Krings, thanks for joining us, and you can share your screen. Uh, thank you very much. You'll have to stop scaring, uh, sharing your screen for a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Uh, I hope you uh, can hear me well and see my presentation. It's a great honor for me uh, to speak today uh, to you. Thank you very much uh, to you, Matthias, and uh, to Professor Cameron McDougall for inviting me to speak about a rather esoteric topic. Uh, when I gave you a couple of uh, potential lectures I can give, uh, you chose the one that is actually the rarest disease. Uh, we are speaking about a subset of dural arteriovenous fistula, a subset that have additional pile supply. And we will discuss first in our, our talk a little bit about what are dural arteriovenous fistulas and then what are those with pile supply and why is it of importance? I have nothing to disclose in relation to the contents uh, of uh, this uh, presentations. Um, and I would like to acknowledge right from the start the team at the Toronto Western with uh, Dr. Agit, Dr. Nicholson, Karl Tabrouche, my predecessor, or neurovascular surgeon Ivan Radovanovic, but also the team of the Japanese Society of Neuroendovascular Therapies, here in particular Dr. Kiyosui, uh, with whom we discussed about this rare entity, uh, and Dr. Osaki, who went uh, to the Toronto Western Hospital for one year research fellowship to look through all of our cases and identify those that have pile supply. So let's uh, uh, dig right in and go one step back first. What are dural arteriovenous fistulas? Of course, we all know these are shunts that are fed by arteries that would normally supply the dura, but not the brain. This is what we learned in residency. This is what we learned in medical school. However, uh, like uh, with everything in medicine and anatomy, there's never, never, and never always, there are also those shunts that are dural shunts that have additional pile supply, which is normally thought to be only for those shunts that are the true pile brain AVMs, i.e. shunts that are fed by arteries that would normally supply the brain. So if you look at this case here, there's no question. We have a dural arteriovenous fistula. We have a fistula here, early venous filling of the transverse sinus and the uh, torcular region uh, fed by arteries that would normally supply the meninges or the bone here, the occipital artery, transosseous branches, the middle meningeal artery. But the same patient also had additional, very tortuous, small feeders going towards the same shunting region with some wash out here, indicating that this dural arteriovenous fistula had additional pile supply. Or look at this patient here, where we injected the vertebral artery. You can see uh, that the vertebral artery is ending into the pica, and there's a shunt right here going towards uh, the pile veins or the uh, cortical veins of the posterior fossa. And this shunt is uh, fed by an artery that arises clearly here from the pica and then has a straight course going right here towards the shunting zone. So you may say, okay, what's the big deal? Uh, these are shunts that have additional supply. So what? Well, there are a couple of case reports and even small case series out there that demonstrated that if you have additional pile supply, then there's a higher risk of hemorrhagic complication. In fact, in uh, the, uh, one of those articles, uh, although the number is small, they found uh, that uh, the incidence of hemorrhagic complications in those patients who have additional supply was significantly higher compared to patients 
who have dural arteriovenous fistulas without pile arterial supply. And the reason why um, these groups uh, and we as interventionists believe that this is indeed the case is highlighted by this case report here from Ken Sato from uh, Japan uh, that I will uh, briefly go through with you. We have here a patient who obviously has a dural arteriovenous fistula that is supplied by transosseous branches from the occipital artery, posterior auricular artery, but there's also supply coming here from the middle meningeal artery, clearly indicating that the shunt location is within the dura mater here, and we have direct reflux into a cortical vein. Therefore, we have a high borden or cognac uh, type fistula. Treatment is definitely indicated. Always do a six vessel angiography when you evaluate a shunt and uh, when doing the six vessel angiography and injecting into the vertebral artery, uh, they found that in addition to this dural supply, there was also evidence for supply coming from the posterior cerebral artery right here, going into a network of abnormal vessels prior to then hitting the same vein that was also supplied by the meningeal arteries. Now, this is the uh, uh, microcatheter uh, injection of uh, the uh, catheter here. You see the supply going into the dural leaflets right here. Um, we see the onyx cast with some reflux into the middle meningeal artery here, but a very nice cast filling the entire sinus and the vein. And this is the follow-up angiography uh, demonstrating occlusion of the fistula here but also no longer evidence for shunting coming from the PCA. However, if you look very carefully here at this arrow, there's still evidence for this abnormal pile network of the PCA vessels that, well, doesn't shunt any longer. So uh, they thought, okay, we are good, we are fine, uh, patient uh, is uh, cured. However, patient presented with a massive subdural plus a parenchymal hemorrhage here, indicating that we have a rupture of the dural arteries fistula following treatment. Patient was brought to theater. And what we can see here is the onyx cast in the embolized vein. This is the transverse sinus here. And uh, we see right here, the angry red vessels coming from the PCA, trying to enter into the sinus that is now completely occluded being the source of the hemorrhage. So what has happened in this patient is very similar to what happens in brain AVMs if you take the vein before you take all pile arterial supply, you will get a relatively early hemorrhage within the first 24 hours that is not a transvenous or not a venous hemorrhage, but a true arterial hemorrhage with a breakthrough into the parenchyma. And this is related likely to the fact that you have taken the vein without having taken the pile arteries. And therefore, indeed, in those patients who have dural arteriovenous fistulas with pile supply, there is, and it makes sense, to have an increased risk of hemorrhage if uh, 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 you treat uh, only the venous component of this arteriovenous shunt. So together with uh, Dr. Osada, uh, who was a research fellow with us a couple of years ago, we looked at the Toronto Western uh, experience and published this in neurosurgery in 2018 and found that we had of 204 patients that we had looked at between 2010, when I arrived at the Toronto Western, and 2017, we had 23 patients, so approximately 11%, who had additional pile arterial supply. And then we looked at uh, these cases in greater detail. First of all, if we compare them to all other dural arteriovenous fistula, they were somewhat younger in age. There were a preponderance for the tentorium, and there was evidence for some form of venous dilatation indicating either high flow venous shunts or venous outflow obstructions or venous congestion. And when we looked at all of those 23 cases, we identified two different patterns. Pattern one is which we coined 
normal dural arteries coming from pile vessels. Pattern number two is pure or true pile supply. So when we look at this graph here, uh, take uh, this here being a pile artery, the white arrow going towards the brain. This here, the black arrow being a meningeal artery going towards the shunt denoted by the asterisk with uh, the arrowhead pointing towards a vein. You can have number one, the following situation that from a pile artery, you have a dural branch that may or may not interconnect with other meningeal branches. So think about this, for example, being, let's say, the ICA. Think about this being the artery of Bernasconi and Casanari. Think about this being the middle meningeal artery. Then you can easily identify why you have certain shunts that are fed indirectly from pile arteries. Indirectly, because it first goes into a dural branch that then goes towards the shunt. So these are true dural branches arising from pile arteries. And these has to be, uh, this scenario has to be differentiated from the second scenario, where again, this is a true meningeal branch. Let's say this is the middle meningeal artery. This is a true pile branch. Let's say this is a distal MCA branch. And let's say this is again, our cortical vein. Here's the shunt fed primarily by let's say the middle meningeal artery, but we have a network of abnormal pile vessels feeding also into the shunt. So this would be denominated the pure pile supply, whereas this would be denominated as true dural arteries arising from pile branches. Now, this sounds very theoretical, Let's go deeper into first scenario A. And I think we all know the classical dilated or normal dural branches arising from pile arteries. I think we all know the Bernasconi uh, artery right here. Or we all know that from the ICA, we can have the meningohypophyseal trunk or the inferior lateral trunk that supplies the dura of the cavernous sinus and the clivus. So therefore, if you have a cavernous sinus dural arteriovenous fistula, it is actually quite likely that this patient will be getting supply from the internal carotid artery through dural branches. And these are normal dural branches that everyone has. And of course, in uh, patients with dural arteriovenous fistulas, they are hypertrophied so that we can actually see them. We also all know that the posterior meningeal artery can arise physiologically from a pile artery. For example, from the pica in this example here, this is a patient who didn't have a shunt where you can see uh, we have the pica, the tonsillar loop right here. And from the tonsillar loop on the inferior margin, we have a small artery that has this very straight course that goes towards the posterior meninges. So this is a normal dural branch arising from pile arteries. And remember, this is the case that I showed you uh, at the very beginning, vertebral artery injection. This is the uh, pica and we see a dural shunt here. We know it's dural because this is a straight vessel. This is the posterior meningeal artery. So these are dural branches from pile vessels that we all know. And then there are the slightly lesser known branches. For example, the artery of Davidov and Schechter. This is an artery that arises from the posterior cerebral artery and that uh, goes towards the tentorium. An example here where we see from the PCA a straight vessel going to this falcotentorial branch of uh, to this falcine artery that then goes towards uh, the shunt uh, up here, uh, indicating that we have uh, like here a PCA territory um, a dural supply. 
another example here of a shunt that is fed by the posterior meningeal artery at the level of the falcotentorial notch. And in addition to the posterior meningeal artery, we also see clear supply coming from the PCA. But this PCA supply is the normal artery of Davidoff and Schechter. Look at this straight course here going directly into the falcotentorial notch. In addition, the tentorium can be fed by the so-called artery of Wollschläger and Wollschläger that has also been uh, coined uh, the artery of uh, Byrne, um, uh, as uh, uh, James Byrne had uh, described this a couple of years ago. Uh, but looking into the literature, it was previously described by uh, two German anatomists called Wollschläger, a uh, couple that demonstrated that from the superior cerebellar artery, this is a, a picture from um, uh, the, uh, an artery uh, from the article of uh, Dr. Bugal, there can be a small branch going towards the tentorium that is a physiological or normal branch. However, this physiological branch can be hypertrophied or can be enlarged in patients with dural arteriovenous fistula. Here another example, this is from Philippe Mercier, a, a French uh, anatomist, where you can see the superior cerebellar artery right here. And from the superior cerebellar artery, there's a straight vessel going towards the dura, leading to dural supply in the medial uh, and anterior component of the tentorium. And this uh, tentorial branch can supply also the more posterior medial components of the tentorium. And now we move to the very uh, significantly lesser known dural branches that are physiological branches arising from pile arteries. We had here a patient with a cavernous sinus dural arteriovenous fistula. Uh, so no big deal here, fed by uh, uh, ILT, MHT, uh, um, and uh, uh, draining uh, outwards. But always remember, when you have a patient with a dural arteriovenous fistula, always do a six vessel angiography. And when injecting into the vertebral artery, we saw the shunt. Now, how did we see the shunt? Well, is this evidence for posterior communicating artery going then somehow via maybe ILT or MHT into the shunt? Uh, if you're not sure, do a vaso CT. And on vaso CT, we demonstrated that we indeed saw an anteriorly pointing dural branch arising from uh, the SCA going towards the cavernous sinus. So this is a rare branch, but it does exist, a dural supply to the cavernous sinus from the anterior portion of the SCA. From the article of Bogal, simply because it's so rare, we have here identified two different supplies from the anterior cerebral artery going towards the dura. So a true pile artery that can have true physiological dural supply. And this is either via the orbitofrontal artery into the primitive olfactory artery towards ethmoidal dural uh, arteriovenous fistula. You can see a classical ethmoidal dural AV fistula here, but it's fed not by the ophthalmic artery and by the ethmoidal branches of the ophthalmic, but interestingly enough, by a branch that runs under the undersurface of the uh, um, anterior uh, of the uh, anterior temporal fossa towards the ethmoidal region. This is the primitive olfactory artery that can arise from the orbitofrontal artery and that truly supplies the dura. And even lesser known, the pericolosal artery can have supply to the falx. This again, an anatomical specimen where you can see the pericolosal artery, the frontal lobe here and here. We look into the interhemispheric fissure and there's a small falcine artery that supplies the mid portion of the falx arising from the pericolosal artery. So if you have a shunt arising from a pericolosal artery, always ensure that this is not a 
necessarily always a pile shunt, it can be a dural arteriovenous shunt. Also quite uncommon, we can have direct branches arising from the vertebral artery that go to the foramen magnum. You can see that these branches can either arise directly from the frame uh, from the vertebral artery, as in this example here, or they can arise from the most proximal portion of the pica, not going towards the posterior meningeal artery, but going to the foramen magnum. And these have to be differentiated from true pile arteriovenous shunts uh, at this location here. And then there's the subarcuit artery that uh, arises from the ICA as a physiological dural branch coming from a pile vessel. We can uh, look here into the CP angle in this specimen and in this specimen here. You see, this is the ICA. The ICA has the classical uh, loop going towards the IAC. Um, and at the apex of the ICA loop, there's a small branch going towards uh, the petrosquamosal ridge and towards the dura of the IAC. And this is this branch here that uh, goes in between the seventh and eighth nerve to supply the dura posterior uh, to, uh, of uh, the internal auditory canal at the level of uh, the petrous ridge. And this is the subarcuate artery. And again, if you have a fistula at this location here, it can be fed by an ICA. And at first glance, you would see that in this patient here, oh, well, we have an ICA fed shunt. So this should be an AVM. Be wary if it arises from a vessel that goes straight after the loop at the level of the IAC to then reach uh, uh, like the dura along the petrous apex and along the petrous ridge, this can very well be a dural arteriovenous shunt. So how can you now know whether you have a true dural branch from a pile artery uh, as compared to either a pure pile supply or a pile AVM? You have to know your anatomy. You need to know what vessels can physiologically carry dural branches. And you should always do, whenever you have a shunt, a six vessel angiography, both ICAs, both ECAs, and both vertebral arteries, and use Vaso CT to pinpoint where the shunt is. Is the shunt embedded in the brain parenchyma, or is the shunt along the dura? or is the shunt actually within the bone? The vaso CT will be able to exactly tell you where the shunt is and therefore can tell you whether you have a dural shunt or a pile shunt. And then remember that there are the easily identified dural branches, Bernasconi, ILT, MHT, the posterior meningeal artery from the pica. There are those that are maybe a little bit more difficult, the Davidoff and Schechter, Wolschläger and Wolschläger, i.e. PCA supply and SCA supply to the tentorium. And then there are those lesser known dural branches that uh, you should keep in mind, the direct branches of the vertebral artery to the foramen magnum, the subarcuit artery from the ICA, the cavernous branch of the superior cerebellar artery, the falcine artery from the ACA, pericolosal artery, and the primitive olfactory artery from the ACA. These are your normal dural branches from pile arteries. And when we talk about treatment, you will see that these types of branches do not bleed if you are not taking them, because these are just normal dural branches i.e. they are embedded in the dura, they do not burst if you take the sinus, if you take the vein only without refluxing into them. And this is in stark contrast. Okay, I think he has some, some kind of network issues, but we can wait.
Yeah, Professor Kringer frozen. Yeah, probably has some, some kind of internet problems. We want to wait a few minutes until Professor Krings connects again. In the meanwhile, if you have any questions, you can you can put them in the chat. It's frustrating. It's like watching a, a great movie. We're just getting to the to the yeah. We're just the, getting the defense is building there. I was really enjoying it. Getting so, the flow. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully we'll have him. Uh, I think he's trying to come back. Yeah, yeah, great. Doctor McDougall. Uh, Vaso City is the same as Dyna City? Uh, yeah, basically. Okay. I, I, am I... Uh... I'm, I'm so sorry, am I back again? Yeah, yeah, now we can you see you again. Yeah, okay, so uh, the internet in my house broke uh, just down, like... <laughs> What, uh, what, uh, like, what? so I am extremely sorry about this. Uh, maybe my kids uh, did too much online learning. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, um, I am not sure where we broke off, but uh, let me go back uh, to uh, did, did you see uh, this? No, before, also yeah. before this one, I broke off before. Yeah, before we were still in the dural, the dural regular. Did you yes, see? There you are. You the, yeah, we saw this. You had, you had, okay, we saw the summary slide. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it broke off at a perfect uh, broke break off point. Then, because we are now going to the uh, next uh, type of um, pile supply, and this is now the true pile supply in patients uh, with dural arteriovenous fistulas. So these are the non-physiological vessels, i.e. those vessels that are secondarily induced by the shunt and uh, that can cause problems uh, uh, here. And these can occur in our series anywhere. They were in the minority if we compare those to uh, the normal or physiological dural branches. I showed you this example here where we have uh, transosseous branches, middle meningeal branches, but also these tortuous branches going towards uh, the transverse sinus. And in this patient here, we had a remote venous thrombosis. Then we have this patient here who has an isolated sinus, also in identifying therefore that there is a previous venous thrombosis with cortical venous reflux and drainage or and the feeding vessels being very diffuse vessels here coming from the middle meningeal artery and the posterior auricular artery, and additional supply arising here from the MCA branches, right here, with an abnormal network of, abno uh, of, of vessels very close to where the um, shunting zone is. Then this example here, again from Ken Sato, where in addition to the middle meningeal and transosseous branches, again in a patient with more or less an isolated sinus and the Borden type 3 fistula, we see a network of abnormal vessels that is located actually on the dura within a, like a nearly a nidus type surrounding the dural sinus right here. 
Here is another example. Clearly, middle meningeal supply, significant transosseous supply, way more tortuous branches that we normally see in dural arteriovenous fistula, indicating some form of angiogenesis, and then additional supply from the PCA, in addition to the posterior meningeal artery here, uh, supplying the shunt at this location here. Then here, an example from Valid Brinchichi from the literature that also demonstrates significant transosseous supply. Look at this massive angiogenesis uh, towards this uh, uh, superior sagittal sinus supply with additional induced pile supply from the callosal marginal artery. How do these uh, shunts evolve over time? We had here a patient with a true dural arteriovenous fistula. I didn't show. I will show you later the um, uh, MMA and SCA uh, injection, and we see at time point one small vessels from the callosal marginal artery going towards the shunt here. With time, these vessels start to hypertrophy, and look at this. This is the same patient just a couple of months later how these pile-induced vessels increase over time. So when we therefore now look at the characteristics of pure pile supply, they can occur anywhere. You have torches and ramified vessels, often with a cluster of abnormal vessels going towards the pile vein or the dural sinus, rather than having the straight vessel, rather than having your Davidoff and Schechter artery, your Wolschläger and Wolschläger going straight into the shunt, rather than having a single vessel, you often have a network of abnormal vessel. They can increase over time if you were to uh, do serial angiography. They seem to be more often happening in either post-traumatic cases, but you also saw them in patients after venous sinus thrombosis. In our group or in our series, but also in the series of uh, Valid, they were more often associated with prominent transosseous branches and with signs for venous congestion elsewhere. And all of these findings point towards these shunts being secondarily induced due to increased angiogenesis. And when we look back in 2018, together with Dr. Bugal and Michael Suderman, we published this uh, article on the role of angiogenesis in the formation of dural arteriovenous fistulas and described that in order for a dural AV fistula to form, you need to have both venous outflow obstruction and increased VEGF as a pro-angiogenic factor to the development of true sprouting angiogenesis that will then lead to indirectly su piled supply to dural AV fistula. And this is um, uh, then also, uh, our series is uh, then uh, uh, confirmed by Valid series uh, that he uh, published a couple of years later, where similar to our series, he found um, uh, pile supply in approximately 10% of cases uh, in his uh, 27 out of 201 patients. He found that uh, there was slightly higher hemorrhagic presentation that was different in our group. There were no increased rate of post-interventional hemorrhagic complications, but there was an increased uh, uh, risk for having form of venous congestions. So only the hemorrhagic presentation was different in these groups. So. This was the first half an hour of this talk. So the story so far is pile supply is present in approximately 10% of patients. One half to two thirds are just normal physiological dural branches from pile vessels. They do not bleed post-treatment. However, the pure pile supply, this is where the danger is. These are arteries that are likely induced by angiogenesis. They have relatively typical imaging features, i.e. 
they have tortuous vessels, there's a cluster of abnormal vessels, there are often transosseous vessels, there's evidence for venous congestion. And these tend to bleed or can bleed post-treatment. And we believe that they bleed post-treatment if you treat the vein before you treat the arteries, just very similar to brain AVMs. If you close off the vein, the venous outlet, and your pile vessels are still there, this can rupture. So therefore, our treatment strategy is now has to be accustomed to what type of dural supply or pile supply we are facing. And therefore, in the next half an hour, we will now go through treatment, uh, and I will do this based on a couple of examples. So the first scenario is that we have physiological dural supply coming from pile arteries, and we will subdivide this into 1A, where we have a nice transarterial route, or 1B, where a transvenous route is necessary. The risk in treatment in this scenario is that you overshoot your liquid embolic agent into the dural supply that is coming from a pile artery. And you are not realizing that you're injecting your onyx, squid, or fill into the true dural branch. At one point in time, it will reflux into the pile artery and then lead to true arterial ischemia. Therefore, your treatment consideration in these types of patients is that you have to identify it and ensure that you are stopping your onyx fill or squid injection in the moment where you're refluxing into those vessels that will go to the normal brain. Okay, first example, falcotentorial dural AV fistula, patient became uh, symptomatic with progressive ataxia. We see on MRI, an abnormal venous pouch with abnormal uh, venous congestion, uh, six vessel angiography, middle meningeal artery uh, uh, supply here. Uh, then we have additional supply from transosseous branches from the occipital artery going towards a posterior falcotentorial dural arteriovenous fistula right here. Six vessel angiography demonstrating uh, here in the vertebral artery also filling of the shunt. And this filling of the shunt comes from meningeal arteries arising from muscular branches here, but also there appears to be some supply coming from the superior cerebellar artery. If you're not sure, make a microcatheter injection. So you are going up here, the vertebral artery, you're going into the branch that fills the shunt here, and you see this straight course. This is the AP, this is the lateral view, straight course. This has to be the artery of Wolschläger and Wolschläger. So you know that this supply towards the shunt is a true dural artery. And now you can just treat it from wherever you want. We classically like to treat from the middle meningeal artery rather than from this branch here, because if we reflux, we are here in the pica. So this is my security point right there. And we can see here, they have a nice middle meningeal artery that is not the largest, but a straight shot. We go through this branch here. We see the microcatheter here and here, and we fill the entire thing, including the vein. And this is the follow-up control the shunt is closed, and we don't have to reflux into the artery of Wolschläger and Wolschläger because it's a true dural branch, and therefore it will not bleed. And this is the follow-up in the MCA, and the patient is cured. Another example here with the falcotentorial dural artery is fistula, vertigo presentation, middle meningeal artery supply going through the falcin artery with the shunt zone being here. There's the supply. Additional supply from the contralateral middle meningeal and falcine arteries coming off uh, here. Additional supply coming from Bernasconi. You don't want to reflux into this vessel here because then you may get your onyx into the MCA. And there's supply coming in this case here from uh, the Davidov and Chester artery. So we go via a single branch. And again, we chose the middle meningeal and inject the onyx 
refluxing and tracking the entire venous component. And you see that the patient is cured and we don't see any longer Bernasconi supply and we don't any longer see the supply from uh, the, uh, the dural supply from the uh, Davidoff and Schechter artery here. This is before, this is after, and the patient is cured. Another example here, patient with tinnitus uh, on time of flight angiography, you can see the shunt here. Uh, patient's fistula is uh, fed mainly by transosseous branches here, but also by a middle meningeal branch right here that is pretty significant. We are relatively close towards uh, uh, the um, uh, here, uh, the facial arcade. And more importantly, we are unfortunately very close to a very large branch coming off here, the vein of La Bay. And in these cases here, we need to ensure with some pile supply here from Bernasconi that we don't reflux into the pile vein. So we have to have a relatively um, uh, elaborate approach where we save the sinus with a balloon and in addition, save the origin of the labe vein with a second balloon. So we put in a scepter XC in here and a Mustang balloon in here. Uh, and then we go with a benchmark up from the arterial side, do a pressure cooker technique with two microcatheters uh, here to be able to uh, get into the fistula. So in this case here, there's the scepter XC in blue the Apollo with a five centimeter detachable tip and echelon to do the pressure cooker and the Mustang to save the balloon, sorry, to save uh, the uh, transfer sinus. We blow up the balloon here, we blow up the balloon here intermittently while we are injecting the onyx. And then we can save the sinus. Here's our pressure cooker and treat completely the dural artery and fistula. There's our pressure cooker. And then uh, with time, you see here the complete obliteration of the fistula. This is before, this is after treatment. This is uh, after treatment with preservation of uh, the vein of uh, La Bay. Another example here with the patient uh, with hemifacial spasm and tinnitus. This is the fistulous point, middle meningeal artery. We see uh, additional supply from the posterior meningeal artery here coming off the ascending pharyngeal artery. We see additional supply coming here from uh, the uh, um, from the posterior meningeal artery right here. There may be even some supply coming from the superior cerebellar artery. There's supply from the Bernasconi artery. You need to ensure that you don't reflux into these vessels. And then uh, uh, you can actually treat this again with the pressure cooker technique. Uh, you can onyx this entire area here, taking care of not refluxing into your um, Bernasconi artery. This is before uh, and the uh, uh, before here, the cast here, and the follow up with the complete obliteration of the fistula here. Um, Another example here, this is a patient who presented just with headaches and uh, we saw the dural artery fistula. He was planned for treatment on the 27th, but only a few days later, he presented while waiting for treatment with a hemorrhage. So these are cases that you should treat early on. Um, and you see that the pouch has massively increased. So we went ahead, classical facotentorial dural arteriosus fistula, but there's also supply uh, here from Bernasconi, and there can be supply from, um, in this case here, the posterior meningeal artery, and in this case also from the Davidoff and Schechter artery here. And we chose the most direct access, uh, with which, which we classically use as the middle meningeal, we do a pressure cooker and then uh, we onyx this uh, entire thing. And this is the follow up and the patient uh, was cured. Now, what do we do if the patient does not have necessarily a good uh, dural supply? Can we use a transvenous approach? In this case here, we thought we can use nicely again, a transarterial approach, but we saw 
that there was additional supply coming from the vertebral artery. When we see this, you have to ensure that this is not pyel supply, but true dural supply. And the way that we can do this is by using a vaso CT or by directly injecting into the shunt. And if you see that it's only dural supply, you can just take uh, this without having to reflux into these branches. And here you can see the cure of the shunt without having to go through these vessels. Now we move to scenario 1B. 1B is where you have dural supply from a pile vessel, but a venous approach is necessary. In these cases, you can use a venous uh, approach because these, again, are dural branches. They do not bleed following treatment if you use a venous approach. And this is the classical uh, um, uh, marginal sinus dural AV fistula. These patients often have debilitating tinnitus. And uh, because of the very diffuse osteodural nature of the shunt, the transarterial approach is often not possible. In fact, a transarterial approach can be really dangerous given uh, the supply of the lower cranial nerves in these regions, whereas a transvenous approach is the uh, approach of choice. Always do a six-vessel angiography, and on a six-vessel angiography, we found that the vertebral artery also supplied the shunt. The shunt supply was via direct branches here, but then we saw this vessel here. And this vessel also appeared to go towards the shunt. And remember what I said, if you have a true pile supply, then you cannot do a transvenous approach because then you will have a hemorrhage. So in order to ensure that this is not a true pile supply, you can do two things. Number one, you try to get in there and inject and see whether you have a pile branch going to the fistula, i.e. a tortuous branch, or a dural branch, a straight branch. Or you do a vaso CT. And here we can see the vaso CT on axial cuts. You see the fistula there. And now you see here from where the blood vessels come. So this here is a pile vessel, but it went into a dural branch before it hit the vein. And this is then also seen on, uh, the, on these uh, sagittal views, where you can see here the vertebral artery with the vertebral artery loop. There is the supply to the shunt right here. You can see this network being the shunting zone prior to going towards the vein. And you see that these vessels are all going towards the dura. So these are not pile vessels, but these are true dural vessels coming off again, the vertebral artery at this uh, location there. As such, when you are doing these types of treatment, put the extra effort in and really scrutinize your uh, vaso CT uh, in order to identify what type of shunt you're facing here. And then you can just do a transvenous approach, which would be contraindicated if you had a pile supply. And uh, this is the patient following treatment. Um, and you can see that these small branches are still persistent, but the dural supply is now occluded and the pica remains patent, and this is the supply from the other side, and the patient was uh, uh, cured. Now, we move towards the second scenario, i.e. where we have true pile supply with, however, good dural arterial access. Another patient with a falcotentorial dural AV fistula, very difficult access, and in this case here, I made the conceptual mistake uh, of not doing a six-vessel angiography simply because his access was too difficult. And I thought, well, we see the dural AV fistula very nicely here, so we don't have to do anything more. Um, and you could see here what I presume to be the shunting point right there, fed by transosseous branches from the occipital artery here. So I used a septum mini balloon. I blew up the septum mini balloon right here in order to prevent doing too much of a pressure cooker technique. I thought the arteriovenous 
shunting point was right here. And I thought that we did a pretty good job uh, closing off the fistula point here. And uh, then I said, okay, we didn't do the um, six vessel NGO before, but you know what, uh, let's do just to be on the safe side and to be very sure that we have treated it. Uh, let's inject one of the vertebral arteries and lo and behold, we were able to get into the vertebral artery and we saw that the shunt was not cured because the fistula point was washed out and was in fact here. So a classical uh, mistake, if you don't do a six vessel angiography, you will regret it. So always do it before. This was the fistula point right here. So now we are in the following situation. We have the supply coming from the pica, but remember the pica can have a normal dural supply, which is the posterior meningeal artery, which we can see beautifully here. Look at this really straight course of the vessel. This is the posterior meningeal artery. So thank goodness we can now use the pica and get into this branch here and treat. But look at this area here. The SCA also feeds this vessel. And this is too far posterior for the artery of Wolschläger and Wolschläger. So we did a, a 3D again, and we can see the posterior meningeal artery going up here and here going to the shunt here. This is the posterior meningeal artery from the pica going towards the shunt here. But you also see the superior cerebellar artery coming out here and then giving up true pile supply. And if I now treat only the vein, this will bleed. So I'm not allowed to just occlude this vessel here, the vein here. I have to do one of two things. Number one, go into this artery transarterially and take it, or reflux with my onyx into this vessel here. Here's the vaso CT that demonstrates again nicely the dural supply. This will be our excess route. And then this pile supply right here. So in this case here, we went with the septum mini, the tip of the septum mini being right here, through the PCA, uh, sorry, pica, into the posterior meningeal artery, placing the tip of the septum mini here. There's the balloon. We then blow up the balloon we see that we are just in front of the shunt. And if we are so close to the shunt and we know what to look for, we now use a working projection that shows us these pile vessels. And then you start injecting the onyx until you reflux into the pile vessels. So here's the microcatheter position. And here you see the reflux into the pile vessels right there and right there. And in this moment, you know that you don't have to go now through the SCA. You do the follow-up control. You see that the SCA is not filling it. And you see that your onyx is back in the pile vessels. So in these cases, we have treated both the pile and the dural supply from a dural artery. And this is the follow-up control and the patient did well. Another example here where we have a high flow fistula mainly fed by these uh, um, like dural branches uh, here, but there's also diffuse pile supply from the SCA. And in this case here, we uh, exactly did the same thing. I.e. we did a pressure cooker technique uh, in this case here with a, uh, uh, um, with a regular scepter and started injecting and injected towards the SCA branches. And in the moment where we got into the SCA branches, we stopped to not get too far distal, occluding the SCA branches distally without refluxing into it and leading to obliteration of the fistula. And finally, we go to the last scenario. The last scenario is where you have true or pure pile supply, but you don't have a good arterial access. So you need to do a transvenous approach. 
So here we have a, a patient who had two separate dural artery venous fistulas after trauma, a simple one with a good arterial access here, and a more complex one that was fed mainly by these very tortuous SCA branches. These two fistula zones, number one, number two, were not communicating. So we first treated the easy one, uh, and then we went for the more difficult one. And this difficult one had also true pile supply from the ACA and here secondarily induced also from the MCA. First fistula treated with onyx, no worries. Second fistula now treated on a separate session. And you see that we now have uh, like a growth of these vessels here. And this is the pretreatment angio. And we also saw that there was no good arterial access. In fact, the middle meningeal artery did not contribute to the shunt. And I was very, because I don't think that I would be able to go via the superficial temporal vessels or via this occipital artery into the shunt. So my treatment strategy was here to do a transvenous approach for this fistula. But in order to do a transvenous approach, if we have pile supply, I first have to take the pile supply. So in these cases, I first went into the pile arteries. As we can see here, I took the pile arteries and then I went for transvenous occlusion for the rest during the fistula and the patient didn't have a bleed and did well. So to conclude, if you have dural arteries arising from pile branches, be wary of reflux because this will lead to ischemia. Venous occlusion alone is not dangerous. If you have pile induced artery, you will have both the risk of ischemia if you reflux too deep into it. And if you do a venous occlusion alone, there is a risk for bleeding because these are neoangiogenic induced vessels. So therefore, the way that I treat them is uh, uh, the following. I have, if I have good dural access, I go with my catheter in there. I start injecting the onyx and I try to reflux into each and every single of those pile vessels. If I have the scenario here that I am not able to get all of them, I will need to go in the same session in through the pile artery and use some glue to do a ligation embolization for the shunt that I did not take. If I use a venous approach, then you have to take the pile supply first and you can do a ligation embolization and then take the venous approach with coils or whatever. If you use glue, Remember that glue is thrombogenic. And if you, you take by a transarterial route with glue, the vein, then you leave the pile supply and there may be a risk for hemorrhage. So you need to also go in these cases, if you use glue into the pile vessels. And uh, with this whirlwind uh, of uh, cases, uh, I will, um, Stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank again the team uh, uh, for uh, their, their, their work. And I'm happy to uh, uh, take any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Krinks. It was amazing, really very useful for us, extremely illustrative. So we have a number of questions, if I may proceed. First of all, in, in your in the paper that you showed that you published, that is one of the main ones in the topic, you said that they, I mean, among all of your dural IV fistulas, around an 11% had PL feeders, right? Mm -hmm. there, is, there is another paper by Halbach that shows about 23% of their series had PL feeders. So you said that most importantly to identify them, you did or either basal CT or super selective catheterizations, right? Yes. So. Should, should we do super selective injections in all the dura levi fistulas to find these feeders? Um, I'm not sure whether this is uh, necessary. I think uh, you'll just have to 
be sure that you do a good uh, six vessel angiography. And if you are um, without refluxing, so if you are in the ICA and you reflux into the ECA because you didn't put in a rate rise or you injected too fast or you were against the wall or you had vasospasm, then don't use this sequence. Do a really good angiography before um, and ensure that there is no filling of the shunt uh, if you are uh, 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 injecting into ICA uh, or into your pile vessels. If you see a shunt, then my first step would be a 3D because most of the time you can identify on the 3D, if you really scrutinize it and do a vaso CT, i.e. axial cuts, sagittal cuts, whether or not there's evidence for um, true pile supply or whether all of these feeders are going indeed into the dura. And then know your anatomy. If you have a distal MCA branch, there are no dural branches coming from an MCA branch. If you have, on the other hand, an ICA, know your subarcuate artery and look for it. If your subarcuate artery is dilated on your vaso CT and it always comes off this, uh, this labyrinthine loop, then you know it's just a dural artery and it makes your life so much more easy if you want to treat through uh, now any middle meningeal artery because you know you don't need to reflux into it. Okay, so... Next question is, is there any study showing the natural history of dural EVFs with PL feeders? So um, I don't think that the natural history is necessarily much different. Um, uh, Valid in the My Mayo Clinic series found that they present more commonly with hemorrhages, but in mm -hmm. our series, we didn't see this. I believe that if you do have true pile supply, i.e. neoangiogenesis, there is a risk for them having a higher rate of hemorrhages because you have new piles, pile induced vessels. And um, uh, if we talk about the concepts of angiogenesis, we do know that VEGF leads to immature vessels because if you have an overexpression of VEGF uh, without uh, additional efferents being uh, there to stabilize the vessel, then you get like these angry red vessels that Spetzler uh, uh, described that are surrounding, for example, a brain AVM and that are um, true secondarily induced to form uh, and, and therefore cause more commonly hemorrhages. And I think that these are indeed um, a bit more dangerous. I classically treat uh, my cases still based on the Borden classification. If I have cortical venous reflux, for sure I treat. If I have uh, reflux immediately into the cortical vein, there's no reason to even wait. Uh, Falco tentorial dural AV fistulas, I re treat very aggressively. And if I have a benign dural AV fistula, I treat with the patient whether he can, like whether he can live with the tendinitis or not. Okay. Then in, in, in your paper, you found that the main like predictors of uh, PL feeders are torcular venous and um, venous dilation and young patients, right? Yes. Where, where, where do you think they are mainly present in the torcula, in, in, the, in the tentorial region? So the falco tentorial region was presumably overrepresented because there are lots of arteries, Wolschläger, Wolschläger, Davidoff and Schechter, the posterior meningeal artery that arise from pile arteries. So because I uh, summarized both the true dural and the pure pile together in this evaluation, I think this is why falco tentorials were overrepresented. When I looked at the pure pile supply only, they were all over the place. There was no preponderance for a specific area. I believe the pure pile supply uh, are the ones that are induced due to previous um, venous thrombosis or trauma. And therefore the uh, transverse sinus, I think is more commonly represented for the pure pile supply. Okay. Next question is about your choice of embolic materials for these cases. Any, any, any special considerations? Yeah. So if I use a transarterial approach and I have multiple feeders the, and I have true dural supply, I fear that my glue will harden before it reaches the vein. And therefore, I classically use onyx, fill, or squid. Um, 
to be able to completely obliterate the vein. If I have pure pile supply, I use also for sure onyx to be able to reflux into this pure pile supply. If I use, on the other hand, a transvenous approach, uh, it's a different song. For the pile supply, I take them with glue, just to have a point occlusion without reflux. Mm -hmm. For the transvenous approach, I classically use two catheters, one for coiling and one that I keep in there for at the very end, finish the job with onyx or glue. So my transvenous approach is classically dual catheter approach, fibered coils or thrombogenic coils to make a, like a dense packing, but keep a catheter in there in case I'm not complete and then treat through the second catheter once I'm pushed out with my coiling catheter and fill the entire interstices of the coils with either glue or onyx. So, uh, or fill or squid. Again, I have no uh, disclosures here uh, uh, as to what type of uh, material I'm using. Okay. In, in, in your paper, you say that the, one of the proposed mechanisms of uh, post-interventional hemorrhagic complications in these cases could be like pile vascular malformations or feeder aneurysms. Have you ever found one of these cases? Yeah, so uh, we were lucky that we didn't have in our series, uh, uh, hemorrhagic complications, but we are trying to indeed overshoot um, our, let's say, onyx injection, meaning that I want to ensure that I'm getting into the pile vessels. And if I'm not sure whether I got into the pile vessels, I need to go back at my initial injection and even go with a gluing catheter back into them and, and, and treat them because these are the reasons of the Kensato paper where you see uh, the hemorrhages. And the difficulty is just like the same with brain AVMs. If you have a complex brain AVM and you inject onyx, fill or squid, and you make a nice uh, cast and you close off the vein and you think that you're done because your follow-up and geography demonstrates a complete obliteration and no longer shunting. If you have not refluxed into every single pile brain vessel, you will have a bleed. And this is, in my opinion, the reason why there are more complications after onyx embolization in brain AVMs if you are not taking all of the pile supplies, which is why I'm very reluctant to treat pile brain AVMs that have hundreds of feeders where I don't identify every single feeder. If I have a single compartment with like one terminal type feeder, onyx is great. But if I have a large complex AVM that has secondarily induced multiple feeding vessels and I don't understand all of the feeding vessels, I won't be able to reflux into every single one of them and then we come into trouble and hemorrhage. The same with dural AV fistulas with pile supply. If I don't reflux into the pile vessels and I take the venous outflow and my pile vessel is still going there and still trying to get out and it's now an induced angiogenic frail vessel, this will lead to the bleed. Okay. W one of the observations in your series is that the the pure kind of pile feeders are more, I mean, are more prone to being the young pa younger patients, right? So do you think it's, it's this related to the angiogenesis potential in younger? It, it, it could be, or it could just be related to that younger people are more prone to trauma. Uh, uh, and maybe even prone if, if they are on birth control pills, etc., or to sinus thrombosis. So I'm not sure uh, whether this is um, uh, what, what the underlying uh, problem mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Beverly Keenitz asks if you, if you have you assessed these patients for underlying mutations like K uh, KRAS or MAP2K? That's, that's an excellent question. And uh, uh, we do know that 
uh, brain AVMs, and this is work from Ivan Radovanovich, are indeed uh, even the sporadic ones related to somatic mutations in the KRAS pathway. We have not yet uh, investigated our dural arteriovenous uh, fistulas uh, in relation to KRAS uh, or uh, uh, mTOR or MAP2K uh, type of uh, um, uh, 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 mutations, but it's it's a very good point. We did have recently a patient who had uh, a record number of seven dural arteriovenous fistulas, including cervical dural arteriovenous fistulas, which are per se super rare, and multiple intracranial dural arteriovenous fistulas. And this patient presented not with dural AV fistulas, but with a ruptured bowel. So yes, there must be something there something you know, for yeah. sure. And we have no idea what it is, but... Uh, uh, the, the plot thickens that many of our vascular malformations may actually be related to one form or the other to an overshooting reaction to VGF um, and therefore may actually have underlying uh, uh, abnormalities in the angiogenic pathways. Okay. Uh, Dr. Stefan Funk from Germany. First, thanks you for the great talk. And he asked which patients, which of these patients you leave for neurosurgical treatment? Uh, I have to blow you bubble there. Very, very rarely do we treat uh, a dural AV fistulas nowadays uh, surgically. The ones that we treat surgical are ethmoidal dural AV fistulas, simply because it's a very simple operative approach. These are the ones where I'm more reluctant because when I go into the ophthalmic, through the hook into the, um, uh, into the ethmoidal branches, and I now onyx, and I, uh, uh, the catheter is stuck, I have to pull back. There's the risk of stretching of the ophthalmic artery and this stretch of the ophthalmic artery, given that the uh, retin central retinal artery comes off here at this hook and now you stretch, you stretch also the retinal artery. So therefore I fear, and it has been described in the literature that you actually rupture the central retinal artery. So. Uh, for us, anterior ethmoidal dural AV fistulas are surgical cases. And then some of uh, the cases uh, at the petrous apex uh, are surgical cases because uh, they often are osteodural arteriovenous shunts. They are close to uh, the facial arcade. And it's a Janetta type of approach where Dr. Radovanovich does a beautiful job just closing the vein at the level of where the vein often the superior petrosal veins come, comes out of the bone, just clip the vein. So these are our classical surgical cases, but all of our cases are discussed. And I think this is uh, like important. Uh, we are not living in a bubble. All of our cases should be discussed between um, conservative management. We always have a neurologist in our team uh, between open surgical management, uh, endovascular management, or even rarely uh, for dural AV fistula, uh, like um, not in the uh, been, uh, malignant ones, uh, gamma knife radio surgery. Okay. Next question is, if you have to conceptualize AVMs versus these fistulas with pure PL feeders, what, what are the main differences? Um, from a conceptual point of view, I think that pile brain AVMs and dural arteriovenous fistula with true pile supply, with pure pile supply, pure. are in a way, from a treatment perspective, relatively similar. You have to ensure to take all pile supplies before you close off the vein, because otherwise those pile feeders may lead uh, uh, to post-operative hemorrhages. It has been described in the literature uh, and, and I think uh, the, the pathological mechanism is very similar. Um, uh, but apart from this, with the true dural supply, the physiological dural supply, uh, they, uh, you can just take the vein and uh, the, the other dural supply will just close off. Okay, in my final question. Uh, in a few series, including yours, there are a few cases of uh, uh, galen, 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 pain of a galeno region with pure PL feeders. Do you think they are like part of a spectrum of the vein of galene malformations? Uh, like that's, frust frustrated. that's an excellent question. Um, and I discussed with uh, Dr. Nimi uh, with this. I uh, discussed with uh, uh, Dr. Hirosui uh, about this. 
we have these young patients, uh, like 21, 22, long-standing hydrocephalus, a true dilatation of the vein of Galen. We see choroidal supply, like in a vein of Galen. We see sometimes pile supply, thalamic supply, and we see dural supply. And they appear to be not your classical choroidal AVM, not your classical vein of Galen arteriovenous malformation, neither are they your classical falcotentorial dural arteriovenous fistula. So, uh, and, and my, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Tali from Israel, actually show, uh, sent me recently a case that I believe is exactly this type of transitory lesion where you have choroidal supply, some pile supply, and uh, dura supply, and these are truly challenging lesions. I believe they can be treated uh, uh, through a transarterial route, but you have to reflux into your choroidal and into your pile fistulas. And I like this idea of calling them um, within the spectrum of diseases of pure choroidal versus pure dural arteriovenous fistulas simply because we don't know how to exactly classify them. But they appear to be young patients with hydrocephalus, uh, with a shunt in this region that is not only fed by, a pile, uh, by, by, by dural arteries, but also by choroidal arteries. So they may be a subtype. Okay, one final question. Is, have you ever used a double lumen balloon like a scepter C or something through the PL? to avoid reflux into the PL region? Okay, so I've uh, used them in brain AVMs, yes. Uh, but the pile supply in those dural arteries fistulas, these are really, really, really small vessels. So I would not go into those pile-induced vessels because if I blow up a balloon, even if it's the septum mini, I fear that I would uh, uh, close them off. I would consider taking a, a septum mini to avoid reflux into the primary pile branch, but I would not go into those small branches with a uh, with a, uh, a septum, not even with the septum mini. Okay, uh, those are my questions. If uh, the faculty wants to add something, please feel. Yeah, let me. I'll jump in. Uh, um, Timo, I really want to thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, that was a spectacular presentation. You know, I, I've been a a uh, fan of the Toronto program since the early days of Carl Tabrug and, and uh, it's wonderful to see you uh, enlarging on his legacy. You know, your presentation is everything we love about neurointerventional. It was, you know, careful observation, meticulous analysis, beautiful images and, you know, exquisite explanation of the anatomy. So I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the presentation. Um, I, I kind of have, uh, in a much more amateurish way, you know, looked at these cases for a long time and really seen the angiogenesis as sort of a, a, a marker of the degree of difficulty. And, you know, the ones where I've seen the most peel involvement are these young patients, the, the neonatal dural fistulas. Um, and, and really, to me, it's been a marker of the degree of difficulty because, you know, not only you have all the peel supply, but you often have a larger zone of, of refluxing and multiple fistulas, uh, more often midline. So, so there's a lot of real challenges, you know, whenever you see that peel supply. You've touched on a little bit, and particularly um, the relationship to, and similarity to the AVMs and the same sort of problem with the neoangiogenesis. Uh, but to me, that it's sort of like this, you know, I think there's this storm of VGF it creates all these little vessels that makes things really difficult and dangerous. But I'm really wondering if on, on the dural ones where there's not that much of the peel supply and, and the, the, the risk is really just incomplete treatment, you know, going from the venous side that, that really the, 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 the reason you're seeing those hemorrhages is just incomplete treatment as, as you see on the AVMs where you don't understand the anatomy. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Uh, like if you choose a transvenous approach, you need to ensure that uh, we, we need to go like 
overshoot uh, and go back into those pile vessels because as you said this uh, angiogenic storm will lead to an increase in uh, the angiogenesis and therefore uh, like more frail uh, more, more more frail vessels uh, and uh, therefore a higher risk of, of bleeding and i do agree too that the more of this induced shunt you have the more complicated your treatment uh, will be and um, uh, you'll have to be and, and you just have to tell the patient that this is not your normal dural av fistulas there is a higher risk in these types of patients and uh, uh, you uh, the patients need to know and you'll have to have a sound indication has that also been your observation though that the the peel supply is also a marker of multiplicity um it is a marker of having a multi-hole shunt uh, for dural artivenous fistulas, i.e. where you have the entire transverse sinus with multiple vessels going into the entire sinus rather than where you have a single point fistula. Um, multiplicity, yes, we had at least the, uh, the one case that I, the last case that I showed you with the post-traumatic, he had one fistula here, one fistula here. In fact, I will have to treat him in, um, I, he was supposed to be treated next Tuesday, for a new fistula that has occurred. So uh, these patients have, and this comes now back to VEGF, should we actually uh, sample their VEGF pathways uh, or VEGF levels in the blood? Uh, well, yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a really interesting point because I think some of these patients you're catching after the VGF you, you know, has, has subsided and they're stable and there's other patients you stumble into them in the middle of it when they're still active and, and that, you know, probably would be something that's really useful to know. Yes, I, I, I fully agree. And then the question is, would a bout of Avestin help those patients, no? Right, um, right. And, and of course, we are here limited in Canada with the regulations, but uh, this, is, this is for sure an interesting point here. Yeah. I'll uh, don't want to hog the time if there's any other panelists that want to uh, jump in. There was one more question uh, about the pressure cook technique. Yes. When, when do you use it? Uh, how do you use it in dual Um It's um, just because uh, we want to save onyx and want to be faster that we uh, use the pressure cooker technique. Uh, like with the pressure cooker technique, you have less reflux, and you're faster with uh, your treatment. Otherwise, you have to build a plug. You inject, you have reflux. You have to wait for 30 seconds. You inject, oh, there's still a reflux. Wait for another one minute. You inject, oh, you still got reflux. You wait. So it's it's more tedious. And therefore, the pressure cooker technique is something for uh, like inpatient uh, individuals or uh, uh, those who are under financial constraints and uh, are not allowed to reflux all the way back into uh, your middle meningeal artery, but only want to have like forward flow. So I use pressure cooker technique in virtually now all cases where I can get with two catheters easily into the middle meningeal artery because you will get the onyx fill squid anteriorly without refluxing and so it's faster. And nowadays uh, or in the last couple of um, cases ever since the Scepter Mini came out, uh, I'm using a lot the Scepter Mini uh, because you have a beautiful pressure cooker without having to use two catheters. And I have no uh, financial interest with uh, the companies. Uh, it's just, uh, I think, a really nice uh, uh, small balloon that allows you to only have integrate filling and it will save you both time and money. Okay. Timo, I, I, I just want to say you, you, you have to learn a little bit how to spin things. You're not doing it because you're impatient. You're doing it because you want to save the patient fluoro time. <laughs> Excellent. I'm too young to, uh, to know all of these subtleties. Very <laughs> <Mystery>. good. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Kriegs, thank you very much. It was amazing, really, for us, for the fellows and everybody. People are very happy. And we hope we can invite you again for another Anytime. talk. Please. Anytime. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Thank you. Stay Bye. safe. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks again. Bye-bye.